Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for adramofoutlander.com. For all things Outlander, from the Diana Gabaldon book series to the Stars TV series and everything in between, this is podcast episode 114, Eye of the Storm, 313, the Outlander season finale. Whoa, Nelly, we are here. Can you believe it's been 14 weeks since we started season three and it took forever to get there after season two ended? I hope we don't have another 14, 15, 16 month wait for season four to get filmed and produced. But if we do, (laughs) we will show back up for season four. It'll be worth the wait. This season finale episode was written for television by Matthew B. Roberts and Tony Graffia, and it was directed by Matthew B. Roberts. This was an interesting episode. I found it to have good pacing. The content made sense overall. I really liked it. I know everyone didn't feel the same, but I'll get to that in a minute. So the star synopsis is Claire is forced to play a game of cat and mouse with an old adversary as she searches for young Ian. The Frasers race through the jungles of Jamaica to prevent the unthinkable. But my summary goes something like this. Claire is in harm's way. An unhinged Galus confronts her. The prophecy riddle is solved. Lord John saves Jamie's neck. The Leonard is crushed. Young Ian is being hauled off. Claire is locked up. Jamie frees her. They find a wild dance party. A new love is declared. Margaret prophesies and channels a child. Yi Chen Cho kills a man. Abendawe is reached. Galus chooses her sacrificial lamb. Jamie gets an ass whooping. Claire stops the traveling. Young Ian is saved. The gems are recovered. Claire remembers the bones. Back to sea, Claire and Jamie play. A storm rises. Woman overboard! Jamie goes in after. They wash ashore. It's the new world. (laughs) Yes, a lot more happened than just that synopsis. (laughs) So how did it play out? Well, Claire is on her way to find young Ian. Jamie has been arrested by the Leonard. Mm -hmm. How is he going to get out of that mess? What about Yi Chen Cho and Margaret having that connection? What are we going to do about her abusive brother? So there's all these things that need to be taken care of. And are they going to save young Ian? Those are the questions we have going into this episode. The opening of this episode mirrors the opening of episode one, where Jamie wakes up dead on Culloden Field. And we see that little spark of life in the bunny rabbit near him. Well, Claire in the opening clip is drowning. She's falling toward the floor of the ocean at rapid, at a rapid pace. And she uses the same line that Jamie did. I was dead. That was a pretty frightful image. And there's many reasons I would be a terrible actor or wouldn't want the job. But having to film scenes like this would be terrifying to me. Not being able to breathe freely. It looked very believable, though. But we have to get to that point later because it's obviously not the beginning of this episode. Claire is stopped 
on her way to Rose Hall by a procession of maroons in progress. They are humming in low tones and walking with torches towards some designated location. And I noticed that Claire's clothes are changed from the ball. But when she left Jamie, she was fairly close to Rose Hall because they just dropped Temerare off and we know was on the way to Rose Hall, away from town. And so Claire would have had to have left there, gone all the way back to town where they were staying, change her clothes, leave the note from Marsley and Fergus, and then go back to Rose Hall. How much time was wasted in that? Was it necessary for her to do that? Could she have gone to Rose Hall and then sent the driver back or somebody else back to get word to Marsley and Fergus? I don't know. It seems like it would be a terrific time waster, though. It would not be quick at all. What do you think about that? If you do have thoughts and comments and questions, you can always call into the listener line at 719-425-9444 or drop me an email at contact at a dram of outlander.com. So we get to see what's up with young Ian. He's with Galis and she's browbeating him and she believes that Claire was searching for the treasure the whole time and that he's lying to her. Well, young Ian is tired of this garbage and he tells her so. I'm tired of your blethering, so leave me be or get on with it, you bitch. (laughs) And he lunges at her. He fights back, but he's taken away. And we see that Claire had gotten out of the coach and is wandering around the slaves' quarters because she's looking for young Ian. And here's where Hercules grabs her and picks her up. Galus is not surprised to see Claire because she's told she's here. Now, Galus lied to Claire about not having young Ian, so that's a little problem. And then she acts off like her friend, her frenemy. (laughs) And Claire's trying to explain that she must have gotten lost. She was coming here on purpose. She's trying to make up some bogus reason. It's obvious she's lying about that. However, she won't be lying to Galus overall. And it cuts away while this is going on. And you can tell that Galus is getting worked up. That Jamie and Thomas Leonard are stopped by redcoats. And they're taken to the governor, Lord John Gray. Well, Lord John Gray is having none of it with this warrant business. No warrant, no Jamie. No affidavit, no Jamie. And he claims that Leonard is basing this on scurrilous gossip of the lower deck. (laughs) Way to vocabulary, John. And he further claims that because... Leonard is not at sea. He has zero authority on the land. And he is summarily dismissed by Lord John. So Leonard has to go away with his tail between his legs. But since he's still alive and kicking, will this storyline impact the future? Is the warrant actually null and void? No, because it's still active over in Scotland. Will somehow Leonard get word to wherever Jamie and Claire will end up? And who will be on the radar of the English? We shall see. That is an unanswered question. And John made sure, before he sent Captain Leonard away, is that he called him Lieutenant Leonard instead of Captain, because he doesn't believe that Leonard actually earned the captaincy because he took it up after so many people died from typhoid. So he was really nastily putting him in his place. It worked, and Jamie got his freedom. And the question came up 
Thank you, Lonnie Diane Rich. About what did Jamie actually do for John? Because he said he, he had been indebted to him as well. The only thing I could come up with after much thinking is that Jamie spared his life outside of Carrie Eric when John was 16 and thought he was saving the English maiden from the horrible Highlanders, and Jamie merely broke his arm. Could John think Jamie was had his debt because Jamie kept his secret about his homosexuality or that he has the opportunity to be a father because he's raising Jamie's biological son. Could that cause some debt between them? I don't know. I think the only one that really holds water is the fact that Jamie did not kill John outside of Carrie Eric that night. What do you think about that? I cannot, for the life of me, come up with any other answer. Jamie and John don't hug. They don't shake hands. Jamie just bolts out of there trying to get to Leonard Hall and the camera pans into Lord John's profile. And I have to say, he definitely has some kissable lips on him. I mean, Lord John is supposed to be a little bit pretty, even though he's masculine. I think David Barry might just fit that profile. He was looking mighty fine even in that horrendous wig. So Jamie's on his way to get to Rose Hall, and Galus is grilling the crap out of Claire. Galus is unhinged, and she thinks that Claire has been following her and tracking her down, and she wants to fulfill the prophecy, and she wants the gems, and she's keeping it away from her. It's bananas. It's all about the new king, another Scottish king. And she's so unhinged, it's scary. And she brings up the prophecy to Claire, and Claire has no idea what she's talking about whatsoever. And Claire finds herself needing to defend the fact that she was 200 years in the future for the last 20 years. But Galus doesn't believe her on that either that Claire would leave Jamie, that Claire would leave him, especially if she was pregnant. And so she pulls out the photographs of Brianna that Claire brought with her to the past for Jamie. Well, since Galus is from 1968 herself, she knew that Claire was telling the truth. Claire was in those photos. And remember, Galus met Brianna in 1968 at that rally? but she didn't know that she was Claire's daughter. So it's coming back around. And then they are able to talk about 1968 a little bit more and about the husband that Gail has killed in order to go back in time. And she said something that is totally, absolutely Gayless. He was one of my favorites, handsome, such a lovely cock. Damn, Galus is what I wrote down. <laughs> she is out there, obsessed and, dare I say, a serial killer for the cause she believes in. And after looking at the pictures, she says, a 200-year-old baby, imagine that. So she's figured it out. Claire doesn't know what she's talking about at this point because she doesn't know the whole prophecy. And... I wrote down, hey, Claire, you may want to count the photos. You can't help but like Galus, but she is one scary mofo. Don't take drinks or food from her. She has her own agenda and mission, and even if she's your friend, it doesn't matter. She will cut you to get to where she needs to be, right? And so she gives the really jacked up apology to Claire and gives her this creepy hug and I wrote down frenemies forever. So Galus leaves, but tells Claire that she will have a servant take her to a room so she can sleep tonight. Well, of course, Claire gets locked in the room and she sees young Ian being carted away against his will. 
And she's trying to figure out how to get out of this room. And she hears someone coming. And she picks up what I think is a giant candlestick that would knock somebody out if they actually got hit with it in full swing. And it turns out it's Jamie. (laughs) And he has a look of shock when he sees her about to swing at him. It's pretty funny. So he frees her. And Claire says, we need to go toward the drumming. (laughs) I'm like, what could happen? Sure, it's totally safe to walk into some kind of ceremony, ritual, dance party of a bunch of maroons who are doing some kind of religious practice that will likely include sacrifices. What could go wrong? (laughs) Oh, nothing. We have to go toward the drumming, Claire says. My goodness, I don't know if I would go toward the drumming. And so Jamie and Claire are peering through the brush, watching the dancing, listening to the music with wide eyes. And I wrote down, um, sir, is that a crocodile on your head? (laughs) Because the leader is wearing a crocodile's head as a hat. Mm Mm-hmm. It's pretty creepy. I don't think I like it. (laughs) I wouldn't want to be his friend. But as they're watching, this ceremony is in full swing. And right before Claire remembers being at the stone circle, watching the dancers, I was thinking how Jamie and Claire look a lot like Claire and Frank did. And it reminded me of the dance at the stones. And so, jinx! I thought of it too. (laughs) And then, of course, they get caught by the Maroons and get dragged out. And we don't know what scary thing might happen to them. And then the Chinchoa gangster comes out and says, they're with me. And the man in the crocodile hat waves them on and says, okay. And then from here on out, completely ignores Jamie and Claire's existence. Yi Ten Cho and Margaret are there so Margaret can offer her services to the people who want to get her visions. That's really strange. And then Yi Ten Cho declares his love for Margaret and that she loves him. Well, he doesn't use the word love, but they're going to go... They're, in it to win it together. And they're going to go to Martinique and live after this. And she can offer her visions to the, how she wants to, and to the people she wants to. And when they go to ask her about where Galus might be or young Ian, she totally freaks Jamie out by grabbing his hand and seeing him on the field of Culloden with the bunny rabbit next to him. And then she grabs Claire's hand and sees Claire in her kitchen in 1960-something when the bird comes to the windowsill and she liked to think it was Jamie visiting her, talking to her. And then she channels Brianna. Was Brianna having a dream? And they connected because she knows it was Jamie was her dad. She knows it was him. And then she tells Claire that she loves her too. And finally, there's a panicked voice saying, the monster is coming. Save me. And she says, Abandawe. I still think it's Abandawe. I've been saying it that way since the first time I read the book. So I have a really hard time. And since it's not a real location, I cannot decipher which way is the correct way. So... Abandawi, Abandawe, Tomato, Tomato. I'm not sure. So I will probably say it both ways and really confuse you along the way. (laughs) So we learn that young Ian is at Abandawe. Margaret has some serious skill level. That's really cool and really creepy. And at this point, her awful brother Archibald returns and Jamie threatens him because Galus Abernathy is their benefactor, their 
patron. And Archibald tells Jamie what the Bronseer prophecy is. And this is where Claire figures out that Brianna is the 200 year old baby. This is like a gift wrapped bow neon sign. I think uh, the prophecy might be a little simple and a bit too straightforward and literal, but it works. It makes sense in the scope of the show. So Jamie and Claire are going to boogie out of there. And Yi Chen Cho challenges Archie because Archie wants to take Margaret with him and he brings his stick out or his cane and he's going to whack her with it. And Yi Chen Cho, again, all gangster, breaks Archie's neck and kills him. And all this time, the ceremony ritual is going on and there's dancing and drums and a chicken's going to be sacrificed. And so Archie just becomes part of that process. He's a really big sacrifice. <laughs> so I don't know what kind of bad or good juju that Yi Chen Cho rained down upon him and Margaret, but I imagine there is some. <laughs> I'm not sure if any sort of relationship could have ever occurred between the two of them if it were real I don't know it's a fantasy show anything can happen it's a little convenient and weird way to wrap both of them up but I still like it and I like team Cho Campbell I don't know maybe I'm just a hopeless romantic Jamie and Claire asked somebody the direction to a bond away and I am not sure if it's Temeraire or not who gives them the direction. But there's no way he's giving them a tour of how to get there. So he points the way. And a bond away or bust. Off they go. We see the stone circle up on top of the hill first. But the cave is lit. And Claire believes that's where Galus has taken young Ian. So they go into this cave. And this is where I get this strong sense of Jamie and Claire. They practically and cautiously talk about the what ifs. And if Claire gets accidentally pulled through the stones, she may not be able to come back. And if something happens to Jamie, Claire has to go back in order to save Brianna. They can't lose her. They've already lost faith. It's tender and it makes sense to how they function and relate to each other. And we see Galus does indeed have young Ian and he's gagged and bound. And she also brought Hercules with her to stand guard in case they showed up. And she's putting out her circle and the picture that's been slightly burned and the gems in a certain order so she can travel through the portal. And the portal happens to be this funky looking pool at the bottom of the cave. So Jamie is taking an ass weapon from Hercules. This guy is huge, right? And... Claire is trying to figure out what to do with Galus. And Galus insists that Claire owes her a life because she saved her at Cranesmere at the witch's trial. But she doesn't want young Ian's life. She wants Brianna. She wants her daughter's life because she lost her own child. I'm like, Galus never loved her baby. Her baby was a means to an end. Her baby was an inconvenient truth that she ended up using for her freedom. I'm like, whatever, Galus. And when she says, for the greater good, I just want to throw a puncher myself. Because how many atrocities in time, in history, have been, quote, for the greater good? How many murders have taken place for the greater good? And Galus is a serial killer for the greater good, because she believes the Scottish king should be ruling Scotland. 
okay, but don't grade or good me because I'm going to want to like kill you myself. Just for that, you deserve to die, Galus. So Claire goes in for the tackle. That was pretty spectacular. I liked it. And I wrote, Dear Galus, I do not condone murder for the greater good, and please stop being such a bitch. God. <laughs> yes, yes, that's irreverent. So Claire is all swashbuckling. She picks up the machete, and she goes for it, and she nearly beheads Galus. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, nod, nod. Jamie had overcome Hercules. Jamie had overcome Hercules at this time, and he tells him to go that he's free. Jamie frees young Ian, who is so happy to see the two of them. And Claire cannot stop looking in the pool. It is drawing her. She hears the stones calling to her, and she's nudging closer to going through, and Jamie grabs her and calls her back to reality. And young Ian... The merc that he is picks up all the stones. What a smart boy. They escape the cave and the stone circle. It's very sweet. Young Ian thinks that Jamie came almost too late, but he's glad he came anyway. But Claire is having a problem. She's shaking and she's remembering the bones. Remember way back in the beginning of the season when Joe Abernathy showed her the bones of a white woman in her late 40s who had nearly been beheaded that was found in a cave in Jamaica? Claire realizes those were Galus's bones. That she will lay there in that cave until they are found and put in that anthropology department. Very interesting. Did you catch that? Were you shocked that she's the one who killed Galus? Pretty awesome. <laughs> and the other thing that you need to look for is Galus's name on Jamaica is Galus Abernathy, owner of Rose Hall. Joe Abernathy, we don't know where he came from. We don't know his people. So is it possible that Joe Abernathy is a descendant of one of Galus Abernathy's slaves? Most likely. I don't know if we're ever going to get that answer, but that's what I think. So Jamie grabs Claire and grabs young Ian and they go in for a family group hug. Oh, they're safe and secure. They're protected. They did their jobs. I thought that was super sweet. Claire doesn't tell Jamie right away what's going on. I'm presuming she does tell him about the bones later. It's hard. Next, we see them back on the Artemis. And Jamie's preparing to shave. And, of course, he's shirtless again. When is he not shirtless, it seems? And Claire likes the stubble. I guess it's about four days' growth. I'm not sure if that would be the good kind of stubble where it starts getting soft. But she thinks it's different, doesn't want him to shave. But he's already soaped his face up. And she has another idea for it. For that stubble. Hmm. And Jamie gets the clue pretty quickly. But I wrote, pro tip, wash soap off your face before engaging in face to lady bit contact. Vulva and vagina do not need soap to be getting rubbed up in there. It'd be quite an irritant internally. Wash face. No strong colognes either, men who are listening. That has no place getting near a woman's undercarriage. So Claire did wipe his face off, by the way. But yes. Hmm. It might feel good to rough up the little tender skin. 
And Jamie's telling her all the things he's going to do to her. Now, I know that several people that I've read, what they've written up, really don't like this part. They think it's too long. It doesn't make sense in the narrative of the story. Why is it here? Well, I think in the context of what we've seen a lot of this season is the intimacy that they've had in this way has been really rushed. They have to be hidden. There's not a lot of time for them. Or Claire was really drunk in that one turtle soup, which is, was great. But this is the time for them to reconnect, rebond, to reset from this crazy several months. And it's going to be their kind of first step back into their new life together. And they have this big cabin to be in. And they have adequate privacy and nothing else to do. Young Ian is safe. Galus is dead. The warrant is gone from Jamaica, but not gone from Jamie's head in Scotland. Everything is good. Fergus and Marsley are below. Everything's happy. So now they can take the time to perform some sexual healing and speak the love language that they both speak. So I think there's purpose in this scene. It felt a little jarring because the scene was meant for a different part of the season because it comes from a different part of the book. But they wrapped it up nicely because Jamie was saying he had a plan for what he was going to do to her when they get back to land. Well, if they're going to Scotland, they're on a ship for a couple months. Like, that's not going to hold water. And Claire says, oh, this cabin is big enough. It's quite spacious. So it fixed that. But sometimes book dialogue to fit into the narrative that has been written into the TV show can be a little lumpy. And so if you didn't know the book material, you might be kind of confused by why the dialogue ran how it did, because it's a whole section from the book. But I thought this was really sexy and it was really well done. And we really didn't see very much. It wasn't gratuitous to me. And I like the fact that it created this evenness between them again. And that they were together. And now they can be new and fresh. So after they're hanging out in their Langorious state in the afterglow. Jamie sees that the sky is turning and that a storm is coming. And it's not just a storm. It's an ass kicking storm and it's raging. Fergus, Marsley, young Ian and parts of the crew were all down below. But for some reason, Claire believes she should be up top on deck as the ship surgeon. Really? What is she going to do? And it's not safe to be on deck when a storm is raging that badly. You could get swept off easily and you should be tethered to the deck in order to be safe. So Claire does end up helping somebody get below who needed help. And just she and Jamie are left and the ship is starting to come apart. The storm is horrific. And I never want to be on a boat in an ocean in a storm like this. It would cure me from ever, ever going on a boat again. And we see them at the rail as they're trying to get down. Their plan is to get down below and this wall of water is coming at them. It reminds me of a movie called A Perfect Storm, which George Clooney is in. That's exactly what I thought of when I saw it. And this wall of water broadsides the boat and Jamie is flung ass over tea kettle into the interior other side of the deck and Claire is nowhere to be found. And this is where we see from the beginning of the episode, her being dragged downward in the water. She's drowning. Part of the rigging is attached to her. If I have that wording incorrect, I'm not a boat person. Please let me know. (laughs) 
and he jumps in after her. And yes, yes, the water was too clear. I get that. They're in the tank in South Africa. But Jamie is swimming toward her and she's sinking and she says she's dead and how peaceful she is and no more anger, no more anything. Everything is white because the sail is billowing around her. And he gets to her, he unties the ropes or cuts the ropes away. And then I called it love's kiss. I'm certain he's breathing air into her mouth. Does he know how to do that? That that's the right thing to do? I don't know. But it's love's kiss nonetheless. And they rise to the surface together. He doesn't know if she's alive or not because she's clearly knocked out. And some of the boat's debris floating on the water. And he pushes her up on top of it. And he hangs on to it. And he's so worried about her. (laughs) Is she alive? And he says, damn you, Sassanok. If you die here now, I swear I'll kill you. (laughs) Yeah, we've all been there. The camera pans away to show the eye of the storm. And then we see them floating. And they are on shore. They have washed up on a beach and a young girl comes up and pokes Jamie with her stick. He's knocked out too. And he wakes and he's not sure if Claire's alive. Well, Jamie doesn't know basic life support. So I think Claire needs to teach him some CPR skills (laughs) just in case. I mean, they are adventuring all the time and get themselves into lots of trouble. So Jamie being able to do CPR or rescue breathing might be a really good thing in the future. Just saying. So the little girl goes to get her parents because she found these people washed up on shore. And Claire does cough and she's alive and she's a mess (laughs) and she's weak. And it turns out that the Artemis is beached up the shoreline and there are survivors. So Claire and Jamie are very happy there about that. And that they're in Georgia, a place called La Pearl. And Claire says they're in America, the new world, the colonies is what I say. And then the opposite of the panning away from Scotland when young Ian was taken The camera pans in to the new world. So we know this is their new beginning, their new adventure, the actual start of their life together here after their reunion. What I really loved in this scene is virtually no dialogue. But the subtlety between Jamie and Claire and the way that they were communicating regardless of words, I thought was really quite beautiful. The music throughout this episode really played its own character as well and how it changed when we found out they were in America and went to black and credits. Well, we heard music from the colonies. It was very different. So what do we have? Well, we presume that young Ian and Fergus and Marsley are safe and the other survivors from the boat. The boat is history. They're not going to Scotland right now as planned. We believe that Jamie is free, but could Leonard get word to the British soldiers in the colonies about Jamie? Will he pursue him further? Will he find out where the Artemis went? Could he find out at this point? Well, there still should be a warrant on Jamie's head in Scotland. So is he truly safe in America or in the colonies? We don't know yet. We know that Brianna should be safe in the future because Galus is dead. We know that they have gemstones if they're still on Jamie after this horrific event. So that's probably the only money that they have, right? 
How are they going to get young Ian back to Scotland? Are we going to see Murtaugh here? Did he make it when he was transported with the other prisoners? What about Jamie's family? Hmm? So there's lots of questions. Will we see Lord John Gray again? Will we see William? We don't know. All that is open-ended. But those are the things that we're looking forward to. And season four is already in filming. They're taking a break for the holidays and we'll come back sometime after Hogmanay, which is January 1st. It's pretty amazing. I really enjoyed this episode. I thought it made sense. It was a little quirky with Yi Chen Cho and Margaret, but hey, whatever. I'm a hopeless romantic. <laughs> they could do a rom-com and I'd watch it. It was a nice way to give them both a life instead of having something terrible and tragic happen to them. How are they going to raise money for Leary? They have to pay her back. That was part of the annulment settlement because their marriage wasn't valid. So I can't really call it alimony, but it's definitely hush money. Hmm. What's going on with Jenny and Ian Murray back in Scotland? There's so many questions. I hope it doesn't take the roughly 15 months between season two and season three to have four completed and produced and in the can. It seems like it'll be a simpler filming than season three because, let's face it, they had to film in multiple locations in different parts of the world and spend all this time at sea. This is a very different way of filming Season four, they're basically on land or in the colonies. So there's not as much movement in the sense of how many places they're going to be. So it should truncate the filming just a little bit, but who knows? I'm going to do a bonus podcast as well to wrap up the season and to look at the season as a whole. I liked this season very much overall. There were some things I didn't care for in the context of the TV show. It has nothing to do with the adaptation, but we'll get there when we get there. So how can you participate in the A Drama of Outlander community? Community. <laughs> well, go to Facebook and you can... Follow the page, A Dram of Outlander. You can join the group, A Dram of Outlander, and you will have to answer three questions to make sure that you are a real person and not a troll. The group is a wonderful community to be in because I rarely have to moderate. You guys talk to each other and interact and enjoy the space without me having to wave my finger and be a big, bad moderator. I don't like doing that. We're all grownups. I'm not a micromanager. There are very few rules that must be adhered to, but I really appreciate the fact that I rarely have to delete a post or shake my finger at somebody and tell them to straighten up or I'm kicking them out. <laughs> I'm thankful I don't have to do that, but that's also the reason why it is a closed group and you have to ask to join because it keeps down that sort of behavior and having people in the group that are there just to make problems. Instagram and Twitter are Dram of Outlander. And remember to join into the Wednesday night standing Twitter chat using hashtag ADOO. It's at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, and we're there every week. In the event I have to catch a baby, normally I can get somebody else to pinch hit for me So what's coming up next? Well, the Drums of Autumn read-along. I have it scheduled out for 42 weeks. The first episode will be up on December 17th. 
and it's only covering chapter one. Be on the lookout in the next day or two on how to participate in the read-along to get the most enjoyment out of it. I will make a small tutorial. <laughs> but I hope that you will stay with me through the read-along. It's a wonderful book. And there's so much detail. And if you've never done a read-along before where you take it at a specific pace and look at the detail and all the subtext and what is really going on, it is an incredibly rich experience. And you will come out of it knowing these characters more. You will come out of it having a deeper sense of Diana's writing, which is so intricate and layered. I don't know how she does it. Every time I reread, I find new things. It's a discovery. <laughs> and we talk about the characters, the plot lines, and I like to research things in the details that are brought up. Like, why did she choose this kind of fortress or this location? Or who is this person? Is it a real person in history? So those are the things that we get to do during the read-along. And like I said, I have it scheduled for 42 weeks to end at the end of September, but if season four comes back in early September, then I will adjust the schedule to have the read-along completed before the new season starts. So please, please, please continue on with the podcast and join me. I think you'll have a great time with the read-along. It's amazing. And you don't really have to go back and read the other three books if you haven't yet. First, before participating because you have seen the show you have a, a decent enough foundation to read the book and to still get what's going on how can you support the podcast well if you want to financially help me you go to patreon.com slash a dram of outlander and even a dollar a month is helpful i support the podcast completely by myself and i think my husband would be thankful <laughs> if you helped out. If you'd like to give a one-time offering, send me an email at contact at a or shoot me a voicemail 719-425-9444. Hey, if you have comments, thoughts, questions, ideas, email me or call in. You can also support the podcast by going on to iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and leaving a review. It helps people find me. Share the podcast. Join the communities and interact. It's a wonderful place to be, and good friends have been made because, oh, you like Outlander too. Let's be friends. <laughs> I think there's a certain type of person who loves Outlander, and it's a connecting piece that is extraordinary. And even though I've been reading the book since 1991, having the books elevated into a TV show has actually brought me some very dear and close friends. And I want that for you too. And I appreciate you listening. And I do want your feedback. I want to know what you like me to do, what you don't want me to do, what you want more of, what you'd like to see, what other content is important to you. Let me know. I want your feedback. I really do. Because I want to make the podcast for you. That's why I'm here. I would still research and do all the things that I do, even if I didn't produce the podcast, because that's the big fat kind of nerd I am. But I produce it every week for you, my listener. So I do want your feedback and your critique. And I want to know how to shape the podcast in the future to make it the best experience for those of you who listen. So I appreciate you greatly and thank you for joining me on this season three podcast tour. <laughs> and until next time, Slange of Awe.